this example has demonstrated, some of the most intense political and legal disputes in multicultural societies center not only on struggles over scarce resources, but on deep conflicts of cultural values and understandings. Arguably, these deep cultural conflicts have resulted in the marginalization of Indigenous peoples' legal traditions. In the past, even when some recognition of customary law was granted, it was almost always circumvented with reservations and certainly almost always placed in a subordinate position to the dominant state law. However, if a true pluralism is to emerge, it will have to recognize a broader perspective, one that will see Indigenous law as an integral and important part of the total legal framework of the Canadian state. Rather than the paternalism that tolerated marginal differences, Indigenous groups, such as the Coast Salish, are seeking a pluralism that will actively seek out a viable partnership. This isn't hard to imagine, given that the common law itself is the end product of a long historical process which saw parallel systems of law developing, often initially in conflict and rivalry, while carving out their, spe their spheres of influence. Part of the problem lies in the fact that some customs are prima facie incompatible with some of the basic rights enshrined in constitutions or elaborated in theorizing about the law, about the rule of law and human rights in general. Indigenous laws and legal traditions often touch on the most sensitive subjects of those legislators, policy makers, and judges who have to determine whether or not to allow legitimacy to laws, customs, and traditions that might run counter to the overall norms of society at large. Interpretation of constitutional and legal rules is often dependent on the overall social context in which decisions are made or the specific ideologies of the decision maker. These contextual and ideological preferences are never more pronounced than when differing value systems are in contact and in conflict. Since law does not always succeed in achieving a minimum degree of conformity, nor is it always able to totally ignore deviant practices, sooner or later, conflict of one sort of another becomes likely. It is at this point of conflict that the true values of a society will often be tested. On the one hand, the strength and rationale of its overall norms, and on the other hand, its commitment to pluralism. Arguably, in the past, the former issue was of major concern, but today, the, late, the latter consideration is becoming of major importance. Sovereignty is perhaps the key factor at issue between some of the indigenous communities of the world, such as the Coast Salish peoples and the states in which they live. Recent years have seen an increasing awareness of past injustices and present needs and demands of indigenous groups have focused on redefining the meaning of sovereign power. It has become apparent that however much the political leaders of the modern states may wish to minimize the past of these indigenous peoples, their legal traditions live on the question then revolves around whether or not the state is willing to divest itself of some of its internal sovereignty. There should be no question as to whether or not indigenous peoples, such as the Coast Salish people, occupy a prominent place within Canada's pluralistic legal tradition. The Coast Salish legal tradition is an intricate and complex system, built upon both inherent and contingent principles capable of transformation and development within the communities to which they apply. Although there may be some aspects of the legal tradition which sit uncomfortably with some academics, judges, and politicians of the Canadian state, this cultural difference is not enough to deny these legal traditions their rightful place within the Canadian legal order. The issue then becomes establishing the proper intercultural dispute resolution process so as to enable a cross-cultural dialogue to occur. 
These processes should be designed to the, meet the needs, capacities, and sensibility of those they serve. Although I'm not suggesting that the Coast Salish legal tradition holds the answers to the resolution, holds all the answers to the resolution of this conflict, I am suggesting that the incorporation of their legal principles into a dispute resolution process could prove to be very fruitful, especially given the pluralistic nature of their legal tradition themselves. As you have heard in one of the previous lectures in these series, we're attempting to utilize the international human rights system in order to garner recognition for their customary property laws. The case concerns the 1884 expropriation of over 237,000 hectares of resource-rich land from the traditional territories of the Hulkamina peoples on Vancouver Island. The Hulkamina peoples allege that Canada has violated international human rights norms by refusing to negotiate for any form of redress for the expropriated lands, which are now mostly in the hands of large forest companies, and by failing to protect Hulkamina interests when the dispute remains unresolved. Three years ago, um, in March of 2009, Professor Rob Williams, Jr. argued the case of the Hulkamina Treaty Group versus Canada at the Inter-American Human Rights Commission on Hum Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in Washington, D.C., asserting their Aboriginal land claims. In agreeing to hear the complaint, the Inter-American Commission ruled that the available mechanisms to resolve this dispute in Canada, whether through negotiation or litigation, are too onor onerous and too constrained in the protection of human rights to live up to the standards of international justice. In October, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights held its first ever hearing into the violation of Indigenous land rights in Canada. Craig Benjamin, campaigner for the human rights of Indigenous peoples with Amnesty International Canada said, the case now before the Inter-American Commission highlights crucial issues of justice that affect not only the Hulkamina peoples, but Indigenous peoples across Canada. The very fact that a respected international human rights body, like the Commission, is investigating these issues should be a wake-up call to the federal and provincial governments and to all Canadians. As this complaint demonstrates, inevitably looming in the background of most discussions about the rights of Indigenous peoples and minorities is the right to self-determination. Explicit reference to this right is included in Article 3 of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In terms almost identical to Article 1 of both the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. It reads, Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. However, affirmation of Indigenous peoples' right to self-determination in Article 3 was one of the reasons for the delay in the Declaration's adoption by the General Assembly. As explained by the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights and fundamental freedoms of Indigenous peoples, self-determination for any given sphere of community has two complementary dimensions in relation to the structuring of government authority. One, inward looking, having to do with internal or local self-governance, and another, which is outward looking, having to do with participation in the larger decision-making processes of government. In regards to the first dimension of self-determination, the Declaration affirms the rights of Indigenous peoples to self-government or autonomy in matters related to their internal or local affairs. This includes the right to maintain and develop their own authority structures, including customary laws, in accordance with universal human rights standards and the means of financing these autonomous functions. The second complementary dimension of self-determination 
concerns indigenous people's participation in the larger political and social order. In this regard, indigenous peoples have the right to participate in state decision making on a footing equal to that of all others and to be consulted through their own representative institutions when their particular interests are affected by the decisions of any state institution or government actor. In addition to their right to full participation in the political mainstream, Indigenous peoples are entitled to special consultation procedures in accordance with the UNDRIP when government decisions are made that affect Indigenous peoples' legitimate interests in specific ways that are not generally shared by others in society. An important consideration in all of the above is the territorial aspect of Indigenous peoples' self-determination. Aptly, aptly described by ILO Convention 169, the concept of territory covers the total environment of the areas which the Indigenous peoples concerned occupy or otherwise use. As Indigenous territory should be understood to include not just areas of contemporary physical use, but also ancestral or traditional use that communities continue to have significance within their contemporary life, including cultural and religious domains. Indigenous people's autonomy over particular subjects of local or internal concern, along with their participation in wider decision making, should together extend to matters throughout their respective territories in ways commensurate with the exercise of their rights to political participation, cultural integrity, and social and economic development. As one can see then, a favorable decision by the Commission could have huge ramifications for the whole community of people and Indigenous peoples in Canada more generally. Although I do not want to suggest that a favorable finding will automatically bring about the recognition and reconciliation of the legal traditions and property rights of the whole community of I do believe that it will put pressure on Canada to rethink its positions on these policy areas. Heather Noon of Lawyers Rights Watch Canada has stated, Canada cannot credibly demand that other states live up to international standards for the protection of human rights, including the fundamental right to equality and non-discrimination, while dismissing those standards at home. Our organization will be closely monitoring this hearing and are prepared to campaign to make sure that governments in Canada act on the Commission's finding. Support for the revitalization of Indigenous legal traditions has its roots in the protection of Indigenous cultures, in the unique historical and political status of Indigenous peoples in Canada, and in the link to the development of healthy Aboriginal communities. There is overwhelming evidence that the development of successful Aboriginal communities is directly linked to real control by Aboriginal peoples over decision making, including decisions on enactment and enforcement of laws. Accompanied by capable, effective governance based on culturally appropriate institutions has been recognized as essential to the, excess, to the success, both economic, social, and political, of Aboriginal communities. The power to make culturally appropriate laws and the establishment of fair, independent, and culturally appropriate mechanisms for the resolution of disputes are essential elements of good governance. The inherent right of Aboriginal peoples to self-governance provides an, addition, an additional justification for greater recognition of Indigenous legal traditions in Canada. There is broad agreement among scholars that the right of Aboriginal peoples to govern themselves includes the right to make laws based on traditions and values intrinsic to Aboriginal communities. Across Canada, many Aboriginal communities are in negotiations with federal, provincial, and territorial governments for self-government agreements that address, amongst other things, 
jurisdiction over lawmaking and dispute resolution. Many others have already entered into such agreements. But the inherent right to self-governance is the source of, rather than the result of, such negotiations, and many Aboriginal communities have moved to establish governance structures and dispute resolution mechanisms that reflect the values and traditions of the community, whether or not they have negotiated a self-government agreement. Canadian courts have affirmed that Section 35 of the Constitution elevated existing Aboriginal rights to constitutional status. The common law, which came into force in Canada upon the Crown's assertion of sovereignty, recognized the continuity of Aboriginal laws, customs, and traditions. Since these traditions and laws were neither surrendered by treaties nor extinguished by clear and plain government legislation, they presumably remain part of the common law until they were formally recognized and affirmed in Section 35. Despite this constitutional protection and the link to the inherent right to self-governance, Aboriginal laws are not valued as law when they collide with the laws of Canada's dominant orders. It may be that former, formal legislative recognition is required to remove any ambiguity about the continued role of Indigenous legal traditions in Canada. In conclusion, I just want to share with you that I have come to understand that one of the greatest strengths of the Coast Salish legal tradition is its flexibility. It lends itself to multiple interpretations of legal concepts and teachings. You may have found yourself tonight drawing different conclusions about the Hulkaminum legal tradition than that which I have shared with you. I would encourage you to explore your own interpretation and seek out your own answers. One of the goals of this research is to bring about a greater recognition of the Hulkaminum legal tradition or Indigenous legal traditions in general. And as my own learning journey has taught me, personal interaction and reflection on these concepts is one of the greatest ways to accomplish this goal. Thank you. I want to uh, thank Sarah for her presentation. Uh, it is being recorded, so you don't have to write as fast as you can write to keep up with her. Um, and it will be posted on Lawyers' Rights Watch website and uh, likely on the Halkaminum Treaty Group uh, website as well. So um, you can go back and review it and try and fill in the blanks in your notes. <clears throat> so we have some time for questions. So uh, we'll take a few minutes. Uh, how much time do we have? 40 minutes, okay. Well, we may not take quite that long, but we'll take some questions um, from the audience at this point. I just want to say a couple of quick thank yous at the end. The first thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. The first thank you I want to give is to the um, uh, man who's done all our videography. The videos of all these lectures are available on Lawyers' Rights Watch website. Sarah's, the video of Sarah's lecture will be up in a couple of weeks. Cindy's lecture, Cindy Blackstock's was a bit delayed, but that would that be up next week, David? Yeah. So the big thank you, I'd like everybody to give him a hand. Could you stand up for a minute, David? David made man has done all the videotaping here, and we thank you very much for your time and, and dedication and your skill at, at doing the editing. The other um, group of people that I want to thank is I want to thank the people who have come to these lectures. I want to thank you for caring enough to want to know about First Nations right and what on earth is this business of the gap between law and practice. And I want to invite you to attend, to watch the videos, to distribute them to your friends and to attend our next um, uh, 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 lectures that we'll give either in the fall, the library's already said that they'll have us back next January, because I want to um, uh, enroll each and every person here in becoming 
a human rights advocate, a human rights defender, and becoming somebody who is part of their community, they say, I insist that the law, whether it's Aboriginal law, non-Aboriginal law, is going to be the law, my law is going to be a tool to achieve uh, equality and justice for people, for the environment, and we are going to oppose the law being used as it is now as a tool for um, to maintain uh, oppression, repression, and to um, secure and maintain privilege. Thank you very much for coming. Everybody.